Okay, once upon a time I lived alone and life was easy. Then my parents decided to retire and move in with me and things became a bit more complicated because my father wanted me to run his network for him, so I needed a network. Everything was static IPs so that I knew which machine was which. No problems at all. One by one my parents died and then I had, let's call them friends, who thought this was convenient because now I had a spare room and they could move in with, uh, from time to time. Okay, that's what spare rooms are for. And they wanted access to my network. Okay, here's the static IP address. I don't want a static IP address, I want DHCP. Because everywhere else I use DHCP. So I've got to change. And I've got to have a machine running all the time. Well, that's what Raspberry Pis are for. So I started trying to set up something to do DHCP for these friends. And um, I came across a program in my search called DNS Mask. And when I was doing the research on this, I found some very interesting stuff. It allows a file, etc., ethers, which will map MAC addresses to IP addresses so that every MAC gets the same IP address every time. So I'm back to my static IP addresses, but they don't know it. <laughs> so I'm happy. Now, I'd actually built up a hosts file, and in that I'd been mapping the, uh, the MAC addresses anyway, so that I had this in case I needed it. So to create the ethers file, all I've got to do is read through the hosts file and sort out the MAC and IP addresses. There's a language for that. <laughs> it's called Perl. Uh, oopsie, where is it? The code looks something like that. All very simple and straightforward, no need for complicated test suites, and it just works. There's one little tweak in there, and that is that I'm using regex common for it, which knows that MAC addresses are separated by colons. Bill Gates knows that MAC addresses are separated by minus signs. Okay, it's a one-off job, so I've got to go through and change my host file. Not the end of the world, but if you ever, ever are using regex common, watch out for that little tweak. Anyway, I every year in the spring... Sorry, don't know what's gone wrong there. This wasn't happening previously... Something strange here. Um, every year in the spring, there's uh, Cloud and DevOps World Show at the Excel uh, Center. Sorry, let's get back to this. I've shown you the code. Oh, crikey. <laughs> um, right, back to the start. The name of this program is DNS Mask. So I'm thinking it ought to do DNS for me as well as DHCP, which is what I really wanted. Give this time to make up its mind. Um, now, I've got a router that does my uh, DNS for me. What would happen if I changed over and switched off the DNS on the router and just uh, let DNS mask do its real job. Surely a Raspberry Pi isn't going to keep up with dedicated hardware. Well, you all know the question, what happened when you tried? I knew my speed beforehand, 290k per second on standard form of download. So switch, ev switch everything over to the Pi. One happy Davis. What's not to like? Now, every year at the Excel Center, there's a Cloud DevOps World uh, talk. And 18 months or so back, there were two very good talks on the second day. 
One of them was about ransomware. And what this chap was doing was a live demo um, how if you got a ransomware infection, which he showed that his virtual machine was going to be infected, their systems would pick it up and roll you back to 15 minutes ago before you got infected. Very impressive. The second talk was about DNS and why things like uh, DNSSEC don't work and that DNS is used by key loggers to extract data from your systems. I didn't know that. And I put these two together and I started thinking. The first move that a ransomware malware thing's got to do is to get a key. And it can't start with an IP address because that's too easy to close down. So it's got to start with a name, and that means a DNS lookup. Well, DNS block lists are old hat. About 15, 20 years ago, I was playing around with them when I was beta testing SpamPal for email. So I thought, surely there's got to be uh, some DNS block list technology available with the DNS mask. And guess what? In the blogs for DNS mask, there's an example for ad slingers. Well, I don't mind blocking ad slingers either. So I downloaded this, and it just worked. And I also managed to find a site that gives a list of malware uh, sites in tab-separated format. So all I've got to do is translate tab-separated format into DNS mask format. And there's a language for that. And again, it's very simple. Just do a split and uh, route all these people to 127001. I'm not daft enough to point my browser at a site that I know contains malware, but I still am prepared to point it to things like YouTube, and we can see that it works. Ad slingers there can't connect because it's going to 127.0.1. And that object is going to need refactoring to use BigInt. Now, I showed you that bit of code of mine, and since then, Sun Tong, or whatever his name really is, has put up uh, some code on GitHub that does exactly the same thing. It's the same download. It's also converting it into DNS mask. Everything's easy. Going back to the code, the other thing that I've done is a little cron job, and you can put this anywhere from cron yearly to cron minutely, depending on how paranoid you are. It downloads the ad servers, downloads the raw malware, runs the Perl over it, creating the malware file in DNS mask format, and then deletes the raw thing. Couldn't be easier. Now, the second talk that I mentioned that was about DNS, and it was saying that the way you need to operate in order to spot all these evil D things people are doing with DNS is to buy their product, which gives you lots of wonderful graphs. Well, mostly I don't like graphs, and I prefer raw numbers. But those that I do, most of them I can produce with Excel, which won't interest you. But two years back, a bit more maybe, I found about out about a thing called a flame graph. And uh, it's standard issue with Perl. It's part of Devel NYT Prof. But like I say, I hadn't heard of it. It's a thousand lines of Perl written um, by uh, Brendan Gregg, and it's available from GitHub, and you didn't think you were going to get it through a talk by me without say me saying this, did you? The documentation's rubbish. Um, it's very much for the internals of uh, computers, and he talks about stack samples and stack traces, and I haven't got a clue what he means. I can get it to work. All right. There's rather more to this code um, than to the previous slot. There's a long list of sites in which I'm not terribly interested, all the things that go on internally where it's trying to find out 
which machines which in my network. I don't really want to know. But all it's really doing at the end of it is finding the DNS queries, turning them round and to repunctuating them because it doesn't want google.com, it wants com semicolon google and so on all the way back. And then runs the flame graph uh, program and you get something that looks like this. It's an SVG file. SVG supposedly means scalable, but right here I'm using Midori because I'm using a Raspberry Pi and Midori is reasonably fast and anything else is deadly slow. And Midori won't scale SVGs. So I've got something that's too wide to fit on the screen. But you can see here I've got thirty two K external DNS calls. And this is a day in the life of the Davis network. So that Raspberry Pi is actually being kept pretty busy. Now the, the nice thing about this is that even with Midori, you can point to a certain part of the graph and click on it. And this is very frequently, and this is where graphs don't help, is the small things that are more interesting than the big ones. So here I'm looking at the system's top-level domain. Yes, it does exist. I didn't know about this until I bought one. So davis.systems is me. And there's several interesting things here. That one's cucumber.io, obvious typo. It's been looking for it, and it's tried to append land Davis systems to see if it can find it there. Can't find it there either. I'm prepared to consider that Asasa might be another typo, but that one looks really strange. I've got to investigate that. I've also got to investigate why I'm getting so many uh, searches for Land Davis systems without any prefix. You can play with this for days without coming to any conclusions. <laughs> now, when I gave this talk about 18 months back to the London Pearlmongers, it was on the same day that Martin Behrens arrived back from the United States with over, with over 100 pounds of excess baggage. Really, he should have left her behind, but that's an old joke. What he turned up with was, was a server that we call the Brute. Um, very nice, got lots of lovely RAM if you want to lo run lots of um, virtual machines and play around with that sort of thing. I am normally very profligate with my uh, power usage. You don't want my power bill, but even I don't want something running at three quarters of a kilowatt all day, every day. Well, you can power things on and off over the Ethernet. There's only one problem with that, and that is that the Etherwake tool demands a MAC address, and I do not spend my life memorizing MAC addresses. Nor do I want, because my house is uh, thin and tall, to have to run up and down three flights of stairs to switch a machine off and on, and I'll forget occasionally. What I really want to do is say, wake a machine by this name. Well, if you remember, I've got all that in my hosts file. So what I want is some code that will take a command from one machine, give it to another machine, and, s and that machine will send the Etherwake command to a third machine. And this code comes in two parts. The client should run just about anywhere. And this is very much based on the example from uh, IOSocketNet's documentation. It's just reading in a, a list of strings and sending them out to the server and then telling the client whatever, uh, repeating from the client whatever the server really said. The server is based on something that I wrote for the second London Raspberry Jam. And when I suggested this to Martin, his first reaction was, this is the thing that you said that nobody should ever run in production, right? I said, yeah. 
You said it was a security nightmare. Yeah, that's right. It'll do absolutely anything the people say. Well, yes, it will. So why do you want to run it here? Answer, because I'm putting a bit of security in place. <coughs> First of all, I'm checking that there aren't any awkward characters in there. It's letters, numbers, and minus signs. Anything else, and the thing's void. Then I'm reading through my hosts file and saying, can I find a host by that name? If I can't, there's nothing I can do with it. And at the end of that, it's got to have a MAC address on it. If you can't find the host name, or if there isn't a MAC, there is nothing that it can or will do with it. So my security challenges are reduced. Really, if anyone's got access to the uh, Raspberry Pi that's running all this stuff, I'm stuffed anyway. <coughs> Then on final thing, it's about row 44, 45. At that point, it sends a, uh, an etherwake command to whatever machine it is. And that will wake it if it's got uh, wake on LAN enabled. It does a series of pings. It's configurable. Uh, and at the end of that, it will tell you either, yes, we've got the machine, or sorry, couldn't wake it. So, out of people wanting DHCP, I've now, got a fairly imp uh, I've now got a fairly complicated system that does uh, all sorts of th fancy things with DNS and I think makes me a bit more secure. There is a trap <coughs> sorry, to this, which is that um, you can forget to power off a machine that's running at three quarters of a kilowatt. However, there's a little bit more pearl behind that, and I haven't got the code here to show you. And all that does is it sits, and once a minute, it counts the number of users. And if that's zero five times running, it powers it down. And that has caught us both once or twice, uh, but you get to learn to live with it. Any questions? Um, there are two steps to that. If they turn up with a new machine, uh, question in case it didn't record there, what happens if somebody turns up with a machine with a new MAC address? Um, first, if it needs Wi-Fi, they can't get on anyway because my Wi-Fi is hardwired. Uh, my Wi-Fi has a hard list of acceptable MAC addresses, so they've got to give me the MAC address before they can get Wi-Fi anyway. Um, and if I'm doing that, then I'll copy that into hosts and rerun th that Perl, and uh, all, in, all will be well. If they've turned up with something that's uh, cabled, they'll get a pretty random IP address. And if something goes wrong, I, I won't be able to help them. But that's their fault for not telling me about it. <laughs> this isn't suitable for large-scale stuff. Um, well, it may be, but some you'd probably want some more sophisticated stuff, probably including bind. And one of the docs for DNS mask says, if you want something more com more complicated than this, use bind. But I've seen some of the bind docs. Too much for me to want to run at home. Right. Thank you.